we do is community partnerships. And tonight's lecture series, I think, is a great example of that. Uh, we were lucky enough to be working with Sustainable Northwest to put this together. They're a terrific organization, and you're going to get a chance to hear more about that shortly. Um, we left time to a couple of logistical things. Uh, we left some time for questions after the talk. And if you do want to ask questions, please use the microphone there. Um, we are video taping Thank you very much for uh, showing up tonight, and thanks for inviting me, Chad, and the others at Sustainable Northwest. Um, I'm not going to talk about energy because there's some people here who are going to spend a lot of time talking about energy. Uh, what, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is this whole issue of how we knit together our rural communities and our urban communities more effectively. Uh, I've had the good fortune of being on uh, the Sustainable Northwest Woods, uh, which is a great organization in town that uh, brings uh, wood products to market from uh, the rural communities, essentially bringing wood products to the urban market. Uh, I've been involved for about 10 years in Cycle, Oregon, and as many of you may know, uh, what we think about with our bicycle ride is how we bring together uh, rural communities uh, uh, and, and bring urban experiences back and forth with Cycle Oregon. And finally, uh, I've had the good fortune to be on Wallower Resources Urban Advisory Board, which is an urban board uh, supporting uh, Wallower Resources and Enterprise and thinking, helping them think through their problems from our perspectives. So what, what have I gotten out of that and why is that germane tonight? I think when we start talking about energy uh, in Oregon, uh, actually in anywhere in the West Coast, uh, it's a good example of where uh, the health of the rural communities and the health of the urban communities uh, are essentially and importantly linked in many, many ways. And you're going to hear more about that tonight. I hope I'm looking forward to that. The interesting thing for me is uh, how, do we, how, do we, how do we build visible ties between those two sides? How do we make that real? Uh, how do we make it more than kind of a political slogan of uh, reuniting us in a time of polarization? And one of the things that I've learned uh, through my years in, in kind of being involved on both sides, by the way, I'm from Burns, Oregon, I uh, grew up on the east side, it has been that uh, innovation and creativity is essential for building those ties that are sustainable and durable. And one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately is how scarcity can drive creativity and can drive innovation. And we kind of pride ourselves in Portland uh, appropriately as being a center of innovation and a center of design and a center of uh, some pretty exciting models for, for how to go about solving difficult, wicked problems. But what I've learned is that uh, there's a tremendous amount uh, to be gained from listening carefully and interacting with folks who are struggling with a different kind of scarcity, certainly a different kind of richness in the rural communities that can inform us about uh, how we might go about creating models for solving some of the state's problems. And so uh, from my perspective, following that creative thread and following that, that thread of innovation, uh, 
and looking hard and listening hard can be the beginning of really creating some ties that bind us together. Renewable energy is one of those areas. Uh, lots of potential, lots of possibilities, uh, and, and we're all going to have to scratch our head as we enter in this time of scarcity about how to leverage them most effectively. So I'm looking forward to the panel, and thank you very much for coming. I, I get to introduce Chad from Sustainable Northwest. All right, thanks, Nels. Um, there's a reason that, that um, I asked Nels to, to say a few words, and I think he hit the nail on the head when he talks about innovation and resilience, and I think you're going to hear a lot about, uh, about that. Um, when, when I was pulled in to, to kind of help on this project, um, with, which Patrick and Jenny pulled me in, they said, we want to do something on energy. And being the, the sustainable Northwest person in the room besides Patrick, he said, you are the one that has some connections to that energy thing, energy world out there. And literally, that's what I have, is connections to people who know a lot about this and do a lot about it. Um, never in my wildest dreams did I imagine I would get a, a rock star panel of, of these three to be able to share their experiences and folks that I've looked up to um, and, and, and learn from pretty much on a, on a weekly uh, basis about what they're doing and, and had, had, have good fortune to work with and hope, hopefully to work forward. We're going to lay this panel out a little bit uh, differently. Not going to come from the ground up. We're actually going to drill down. So pardon the pun on the energy side of this. We're going to drill down on the renewable side of things. Um, and, and we're going to set that stage at the regional level, then talk about some issues happening at the state level, and then actually give some local examples of how that kind of tears up back to the regional initiative. We are going to try to save some time for question and answers uh, session um, from all of you. So uh, let's hold all of our questions um, before, till, till the end of this. Um, I get to introduce the three panelists. Um, I'm going to do that now, and then they're going to roll through um, their discussion and, and hopefully get to, to your uh, interaction part of this as well. So first, first speaker is going to be uh, Ms. Sylvia Hayes, who's the Oregon First Lady. Um, Sylvia also has, uh, in addition to that, 22 years of experience in sustainable economic development, clean energy, work source force development, and waste prevention. She's also the founder of 3E Strategies, um, which is a clean economy consulting firm. And she served as a, a co-chair of the Oregon Renewable Energy Working Group. Second would be Matt Krumenauer, who is the senior policy analyst at the Oregon Department of Energy. Matt functions as the agency lead on all things bioenergy for the department. He currently serves as, as my co-chair on the Oregon Forest Biomass Working Group. And Matt has a pretty diverse career that includes a lot of natural resource background, and that serves as a driver for the way that he thinks about opportunities to integrate policy objectives at the state level. And finally, we're going to hear from Matt King, who is uh, employed at Allow Resources out in Enterprise, Oregon, um, as the Renewable Energy Program Coordinator. Matt is an admitted Eastern Oregon transplant. I'm an Oregon transplant, not Eastern Oregon transplant, um, with a background in water, biology, and fish, including some time that he spent with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. N now he works with local ranchers, businesses, and other stakeholders in the, in the county to bring renewable energy projects into fruition that benefit both the community and the environment. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Ms. Hayes. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. I feel like I should say that I'm about to hop into my presentation because I get up this morning and I get dressed all bright, I'm feeling springy, and I have my new blue jacket on. <laughs> I come out, John, aka the governor, he says, wow, Sil, you just, you just look great. He said, I love the blue jacket, it reminds me of Peter Rabbit. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not exactly what I was going for. I didn't know if I should say thanks or not. Um, you know, they say that if you don't ask the right question, the answer doesn't matter. And so I kind of like lately to lead with the question, what is the economy for? What is the economy for? You know, we don't ask that very often. I think often people think, well, you know, it's to move goods and services. It's to create jobs. The economy is a human-made construct. And really, I think the economy should be designed to make our lives better. 
And, and again, you need to kind of maybe drill down to another question. Well, are our lives better when we've been growing our economy pretty consistently for a couple of decades and currently have a, a greater number of people in poverty than any time since the Great Depression? We've been growing our economy, and the gap between the haves and the have-nots have ne has never been greater and currently is greater in the U.S. than any industrialized country in the world. And we've been growing our economy while we've been depleting our natural capital. So these are, these are the big macro questions that we're taking on uh, here in Oregon as we're looking at energy. Energy is obviously t completely vitally intertwined with the economy, but needs to be put into, I think, that larger context. You know, we exist within an economic paradigm right now that says, Here's the economy, it's the be all and end all, and environmental concerns are a subset. But the reality is the economy could disappear tomorrow and the environment's probably gonna be better off. The flip side of that is every time we have any significant ecological collapse or depletion of, of significant commercial species, the local economy uh, takes a hit. So I just want to frame on the very front end talking about this larger context. We hear a lot the last few years about the need for economic recovery, but I think recovery is the wrong goal. Recovery has a sense of going back to the way things were, to returning. I don't think that's what we need. What we need instead is economic reinvention. And I'm delighted to say that that reinvention, we might not be getting leadership from the federal government right now, but that reinvention is happening from local entrepreneurs and, and, and communities, and particularly rural communities, especially across the West. Related to that, just about a month ago, the governors of uh, California, Oregon, Washington, and the premier of British Columbia were up in Vancouver, BC for the Big Globe Conference, and they issued a joint resolution stating their, their intent to prioritize and accelerate the clean economy. Now that was based in part uh, on a report that had come out just before that, that, that they had commissioned, called the West Coast Clean Economy. If you Google that, it will come up, you can get it. And what it shows is that economic reinvention is well underway in our west coast neck of the woods. They took a look, the report took a look at five high growth clean economy sectors. Um, clean energy supply, clean transportation, energy efficiency and green building, uh, um, natural resource management and knowledge and supply. And it shows that it's currently about $47 billion uh, of economic impact on the trajectory that we're on in the next eight years, it's projected to be about 143 billion. We currently have just over 500,000 Pacific Coast residents who are earning full-time clean economy paychecks. And th these sectors are gr uh, producing jobs faster and paying better than the conventional sectors of the economy. They've also been much more resilient to uh, th this recession, the downturn in the economy. So we've been working within the, within the Kitsaber administration, we've been working on a West Coast clean economy alignment, uh, back to this regional, the regional uh, theme today, looking at how can we, again, in those four jurisdictions, California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, we've got a lot of, a lot of things in common. You know, we share a coastline, our capitals are usually um, kind of apart from the rest of us, or uh, the rest, the larger parts of the state geographically by mountain ranges. We also have a core competency in these clean economy, clean energy sectors. So how can we come together and become greater than than the sum of our parts? You know, if you put if you put California, Oregon, and Washington together, we are the sixth largest economy in the world. If you take Oregon and Washington off of that, we're still the sixth largest economy in the world. But, but nonetheless, you know, there's, a, there's a, a real opportunity there. And what, what we're really looking at, since we're not in the best shape federally right now for taking on these issues, if you can get some strong state 
and multi-state regional initiatives that are proving up clean economy strategies that not only from an environmental perspective, but that are proving up that these really are the sectors and the strategies that are delivering jobs and economic uh, stimulus, then we can provide what I call trickle up leadership. Other places are gonna want what we have uh, proving this up. So kind of an exciting time with that. I would also, uh, in keeping with the urban rural theme, rural communities have been incredibly important leaders in this. And I'll just give a couple of quick examples. Lakeview, Oregon. Lakeview, Oregon, my goodness. You, I, how many of you have, have not been there? You drive into town. It's way out in southeast Oregon. You drive into town, and their welcome to Lakeview sign is a like six times uh, the size of real life cowboy leaned back against the post with his hat tipped down. You know, it's timber in Cowtown. But when they had the, their economy take a dive with the downturn in the timber industry, that community just said, we know we're not going back. We're going to reinvent. And they set up a, a vision and a pathway to becoming what they now, they've now taken the brand, the new energy frontier. And they are on a path to becoming the first net clean energy exporting community in Oregon and probably in the West. Uh, tremendous leadership there. Vernonia, Oregon, they've been hit by two, I, I know you've been very involved, they've been hit by two 500 year floods within a decade. The second time it happened, they said, you know, something's changed here. Hydrologic cycles changed, we're not gonna just rebuild the same thing. That community got together, not one person left when that hit. They pulled together, they moved, basically moved their entire school district to higher ground, built a tremendous green built school. The, while that was all happening, there was this interesting project that was going on looking at why, why are we losing thousands of acres of forest land to development across the U.S. every year. And the Pinchot Institute, which our own Oregon brilliant woman, Catherine Mater, is involved with, she did a study of 16 communities across the U.S. to get a grip on this, and Vernonia was one of them. And what she learned from the, the private timber-owning families in Vernonia was that the single biggest pressure for them to have to sell their land to development was healthcare related. Either the inability to pay for a catastrophic healthcare event for the older uh, parts of the family, or the inability to pay premiums for the younger. So what they've done, and I'll put this in a real nutshell that doesn't do it justice, a bunch of these timber families came together, began implementing certified sustainable forestry practices, were able then to pool the carbon sequestration results from that are now trading carbon uh, credits in the carbon market, and, and by, by the way this is set up, they have got to put those monies into healthcare and also to help fund a community healthcare clinic. It's been recognized as one of the top 10 ecosystem service pricing programs in the world. And the third, the third and final one I'll leave you with, um, just because I'm so impressed with this community, in wearing my first lady hat, I've been working on two issues. One is um, poverty reduction. We have a prosperity initiative that we're, we're working on. And the second is ocean health. Just a deep passion and a concern of mine. Well, it's very interesting to me because turns out the, the clean economy component of ocean and marine uh, resource management and restoration hasn't been being told very well. But Port Orford is an amazing community on the coast in southern Oregon, and they very salt of the earth, pretty conservative leaning. They have a fishing heritage. A third of their economy comes from their local fishing, um, and very culturally identified with that. When the, with the depletion of their nearshore rockfish fishery, they were at risk of losing that heritage, and that community came together fishers, conservationists, community leaders, and they implemented the first marine reserve in Oregon, which has been fairly controversial. This was a very bold thing for them to do. And in fact, they did a ridge to reef, watershed to uh, uh, marine reserve, conservation area, first time ever. There's a movie out called Ocean Frontiers that's worth a, a, a viewing if you're interested in this. It features four 
Ocean Resource Management Success Stories, Port Orford is featured, it's one of them. Now what they've done is, is uh, they've, they, they've implemented this and they've also implemented a local Port Orford sustainable seafood program. And they are promoting the use of local seafood and telling a, a, a much more accurate story about what the species are. Do you know that I did not know until I, I hooked up with these folks, do you know that most of Oregon rockfish is marketed in the supermarket as red snapper? And red snapper comes from the Gulf Coast. We don't even have it here. So they're moving into this whole broader clean economy by localizing, being a little bit more scientifically accurate. They're also working very hard to make sure that their fishers are well paid for the products that they produce. Just three examples, I could give you 30 of, of rural communities who are really leading not only in clean energy but in other sustainable clean economy products as well. To bring it down one level further, uh, were any of you at the Future Energy Conference today? So there was, a, there was a pretty significant event goes on today and tomorrow, Future Energy Conference, it happens every year, and it, it um, today the governor was actually the keynote and he talked about about this topic, about the importance of energy and clean energy as part of an overall economic development strategy. And then afterwards, I and a few other folks were on a panel to talk about our 10-year energy plan. And I'm happy to answer any questions about that during the Q&A, but Oregon is developing a 10-year energy plan uh, based on the fact that we've passed a lot of really important lofty goals like renewable en energy standard, renewable fuels standard, greenhouse gas emission reduction goals, but we didn't have a plan for how to get there. And so this plan is actually under development, uh, designed to be, the first draft is designed to be out June 1st and then open for stakeholder comment. And the intent really is to say, how do we meet those goals that we've passed already and how do we credibly bend the curve so that within 10 years time, we are on a path toward a lower carbon, a low carbon, energy system. So I'm just going to leave it with that. That's kind of big picture. I'll hand it over to the other panelists and I look forward to the dialogue and the pizza. Great. Thank you. Um, as Chad mentioned, I'm, my name is Matt Krummenauer and I'm uh, with the Oregon Department of Energy and uh, I'll Start off, I guess, by saying it's really an honor to be in presenting in between uh, two folks. One who's uh, been extremely visionary and helped Oregon move its energy uh, system and future forward in very significant ways, and someone else who actually knows what it means to implement these things on the ground. So uh, I get the privilege of being somewhere in the middle, trying to figure out uh, ways in which we can implement these things and then track them to see how we can continue to improve. Um, and you started with a, with a question, and uh, so I'll kind of follow suit and ask, what is our energy system for? And what do we want our energy system to be for? And so I'll, I'll get back to that, and I'll try to tie um, uh, data centers and, and french fries together as well. But uh, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about how we are trying to tie rural economic development needs and our natural resource needs uh, with the energy opportunities we have and how we can use state policies and, and other uh, programs to help uh, promote and, and leverage those opportunities that we have. And I'll try to keep it pretty brief because I think we want to have a good dialogue uh, about uh, these issues. So one area that the state is trying to work on is really by promoting local energy options. Uh, our rural communities are often faced with higher energy costs than our urban areas and they're often subject to higher fluctuations in those energy costs, so they have less ability to plan ahead for those. Um, but we're able to utilize local energy sources like geothermal and solar and biomass uh, to help keep the money that would be spent on that energy local and keep that dollars recirculating in the economy. Uh, another example of how we're trying to do that is uh, through the Governor's Cool School Initiative, where we're making investments in our schools and public buildings that will lower the cost that they will pay for that energy over time. And the dollars that are saved in conservation and energy efficiency at these schools 
uh, can be better used to educate our children and to prepare our future generations to continue to be leaders in these areas. So really uh, a lot of opportunities to do that and we can take the examples and the success that we've had and build those deeper into our public buildings and our other commercial buildings uh, so that we are really trying to get to community energy savings and affect the budgets of these local municipalities, the counties and others, uh, especially in our rural areas where they, they have been hard hit. So saving these communities uh, will, will save a lot of money and provide other opportunities. And Matt's going to talk a little bit more about that. So I'll switch to say, how do we tie the natural resource needs and opportunities we have with rural economic development? And how on earth do we tie that to renewable energy and energy efficiency opportunities? Well, one example is if you look at uh, some of the communities in central and eastern Oregon, uh, they heat their buildings often with fuel oil that's imported off the Columbia through the port of St. Helens. They also have significant challenges associated with the forests that around, surround their communities. They're at a high risk of forest fire, they're facing other ecological needs, and they need to management, they need stewardship, they need to be restored to their former health. So why not make fuel out of uh, the thinnings that come off those forest restoration treatments and use those to heat the buildings and the schools and the hospitals? And in doing that, you're not only meeting those natural resource needs, but uh, it takes people to do that, people that are in Oregon to do that. And then why don't we replace that fuel oil with uh, heating systems that are manufactured in St. Helens and promote our manufacturing base and promote innovation in that side of our economy as well. And that's actually happened here in Oregon. And those are real examples of things that we've done and we can do more of. Um, Chad mentioned the uh, resiliency and that what, that's what it builds into these local communities. It helps them become less subject to energy fluctuations it helps them to become more self-reliant for their energy resources, and it helps to get them to define how they're going to use their energy rather than being subject to outside sources that are often offshore of not only the state but this country. Uh, so the, the, the other example I'll use is uh, the data center example and, and, uh, and how that ties to french fries. Well, we've seen a lot of development of data centers in uh, the state recently, and they have a lot of impacts and they have a lot of benefits. They use a lot of energy. Um, and in some of these rural communities, they're becoming the largest energy user. One such community is off uh, at the other end of the Columbia in, in Boardman, where they're developing some data centers. Uh, it's a great economic development opportunity for those regions and a great opportunity for Oregon to continue leading uh, in technology and uh, innovation in that sector. But we also have a huge food processing industry in that part of the state that supports one of the most important industries in this state, uh, agriculture. Well, they make a lot of french fries out there, and so they end up with a lot of uh, potato peelings. And it turns out that uh, those potato peelings are really high in energy content if you put them into an anaerobic digester and you turn that waste into a biogas. Well, it also happens that the waste heat from the data centers is the exact same ambient temperature as a tank for an anaerobic digester. So this illustrates that we can think of our economic development policies, our energy policies, and our natural resource policies as integrated and supporting each other and not opposing each other. And it also leads me to think of, uh, you know, these questions about what is waste? You know, are the potato peels waste? Or is it waste only after we've extracted the energy and the nutrients from that and you recycle that into improving our soil health and our energy system? So I think what, uh, what the administration is, is leading with the development of our, of our new energy plan and, and our strategy moving forward and the work that a lot of... Uh, us in, in state government and our partners in the, in the private sector are doing is really learning about our energy system, our policies, the impacts it's had, and evaluating how do we, uh, how do we move those forward? How do, can we best understand what our energy options are, what our opportunities are, and, and what impacts and trade-offs uh, those decisions have? And I think we need to answer that question of how do we want our energy system to work for us and how do we want it to work for Oregon? So I'll hand it over to Matt, and I think he's got a good example of how they're doing just that. Thank you.
So first, I just want to say that it's truly an honor to be a part of this panel. I really appreciate uh, everything that these two bring to the table. And I kind of feel like I'm just the peon on the ground uh, getting, getting stuff done. Um, but Chad asked me to come talk about some real success stories that we've, uh, we've had in, in Willow County. Uh, just a little background. Uh, so we, Willow Resources came out of the collapse of the timber industry. Um, and just like Sylvia said, we, we knew that it was, and the founders knew that it was impossible to go back. We were, there was never going to be another day where the timber industry reigned supreme. Uh, and so what needed to happen is they needed to find different ways to diversify uh, the product base coming from our natural resources uh, and diversify the, the various business opportunities going on in the county. And, and so for the past 15 years, well, our resources has been trying to figure out different ways uh, to get, to get the, uh, the resources that we have and the people that we have back, back to work for, for the county and our community. Um, so they've really, they've really done a lot of amazing stuff, all the way from education to natural resource use uh, to, to environmental, uh, environmental benefits like weed programs and, and some other stuff. Uh, just to give you an idea, a map of the county, there are 7,000 people in the county. It's not a lot of people. And there's a lot of land, and a lot of that land is in timber. Uh, so all those green areas are timber lands. And uh, or that's all forest lands, and the vast majority of that forest land is timber. Um, so one of the projects that Willow Resources uh, initiated is a renewable energy program, and that's uh, that's run by Community Solutions Inc., which is a for-profit subsidiary of Willow Resources. A little convoluted, but we. Uh, our goal in the energy program is to really get projects on the ground, uh, both for the sake of the economy and the sake of job creation, but also for the sake of, of all the environmental benefits that come along with, with renewable energy. Uh, and so far, we've, uh, we've been able to, to keep over $3.4 million of renewable heat and electricity money in the county through these initiatives. Uh, so one of the first projects on the ground was the Enterprise School District. Uh, there's a, a biomass boiler that heats the school, uh, replaced an old oil boiler. It's really easy to, uh, to justify these biomass projects where uh, there's an existing oil boiler and we're moving to, moving to wood because oil is imported. It's incredibly expensive. We don't have natural gas up in Willow County, which uh, can sink these projects in other places. Uh, and we do have a really, uh, a really good wood r resource, so it's easy to, it's easy to get these projects uh, on the ground and going. Um, for the school, uh, we also did uh, some lighting systems and various controls to improve the efficiencies in the school, along with the boiler project to kind of make it a whole package. And with everything, uh, the school is already saving $100,000 a year, which is, you know, the equivalent of two teachers. So that is a really, a really great success story, and that was kind of our, our first go uh, at these projects. Uh, the Integrated Biomass Campus uh, is, was kind of our next our biomass initiative. Uh, it took a lot of investment. It's been going on. Uh, the idea uh, started back about 10 years ago, so it's been going on quite a while now. Uh, they employ, they've been employing 16 people year round, 24 to 30 jobs uh, in all, uh, including seasonal employment and lots more in the woods harvesting. Um, and the, 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 really, the idea with the biomass campus uh, is to be able to, to take our, our, forest, our forest products and use them in a way that they haven't typically been, been utilized. And so what we're doing is, and, and what the Biomass Canvas is doing, is, is taking wood uh, that wouldn't typically be used uh, for saw logs and going into lumber and, and using it for different products, such as firewood, post and pole, densified wood products, uh, and eventually they're going to be doing chips and pellets. Um, and the, this, this model has had huge impacts on, on the way that the, the wood actually comes out of the forest. Uh, we did a study looking at the, uh, the, the cost of harvesting 
for, for thinning projects, and it's much cheaper to harvest if you can actually take the wood to the campus and use it for a diversified array of, of products. Uh, and so it makes uh, the thinning process that our forests really need cheaper by having, these, having all these additional benefits that come into the county. Um, and just to give you an idea, the, uh, the campus is currently processing 100,000 tons a year, uh, and most of that wood is coming from a private timber company in the county. And that's, that's the equivalent of a quarter of their annual slash pile. And so that, that wood would otherwise just get burned. And three quarters of it still is just getting burned. Uh, but through this project and through this campus, we've been able to, to utilize a good portion of it. Um, so it has lots of benefits both in the woods and obviously for jobs uh, and, and for just getting that, that resource base put to use. Uh, another one of our initiatives in renewable energy is small hydropower. Um, so it, Chad, Chad particularly asked me to, to get a picture up of hydro because when you think about hydro, you think about Bonneville. I mean, you think about these big dams. Uh, that's not what we're doing. We, in, in Wallach County, there's uh, a lot of agriculture. There's over $80 million a year in agriculture. And that agriculture is served through, through irrigation projects. And so those irrigation projects deliver water from the various streams to the farmers. Um, and that infrastructure that delivers water from the streams to the farmers has a lot of potential for hydropower production on a small scale. Uh, it, it definitely helps that Wallowa County is very hilly too. So we have these, these sites where there's water flowing and it's going to be there to go into the irrigators no matter what. And there's a lot of pressure because of the, the hills. And so there are lots of opportunities for small scale hydro. So SPS of Oregon was the first hydro project that we got on the ground. We have several others in the pipeline. Um, it's a, it's a 10 kilowatt generator, uh, net meters on the farm, so it, uh, it offsets power use at the farm, and they have a machine shop that they operate there, so they're able to use that, that 10 kilowatts year round. Uh, and during the irrigation season, they use water uh, from their existing water right, and they were able to get a new water right to use winter runoff so that they could operate year round. So the project operates 24 seven, uh, producing clean energy for, for their project. Uh, and with, you know, with that year-round production, uh, they were able to get a payback on that project of less than 10 years. So what does this all mean for the county as a whole? Um, there are some sheets on the Sustainable One with West table, I think, uh, that generally talk about renewable energy in the county and generating local value from that renewable energy. Uh, so pick up a sheet. Uh, it's got a lot of good info on there. We, uh, so far, We've created a lot of jobs. We've been able to power a lot of homes, uh, but there's still a lot to, a lot to be had. Um, right now, $3.4 million is 2% or 1% or of the total GDP of the county. Uh, we'd like to see that grow and keep as many energy dollars in the county as we can. Uh, and eventually, if you know, we, we have the natural resource base, both in, or in biomass, in hydro, and also in solar, uh, to, to eventually really get, get the county off the grid uh, and be able to produce all our own energy in county and keep all of those energy dollars in the county, both creating jobs and all these external benefits for, for the, the environment as a whole. Um, so moving forward, uh, we have some really good projects in the pipeline. One of them uh, is, a, is a pressurized pipe project. We're looking at taking water out of the Wallow Lake Dam uh, to pressurize a whole part of the Upper Joseph Valley. And at this time, the, the way it works is there are these open canals, the water comes from the dam, goes in the open canals, uh, and then people pump out of the canals to irrigate their land. Uh, in just this 14,000 acre part of the valley, the, the en pumping energy cost is $500,000 a year. So, and all that money is going out of the county. So we, uh, we're looking at pressurizing those pipes, putting in some small hydro here and there, uh, and, and trying to eliminate that energy, that energy requirement for irrigators. Um, we also have some serious thinning that has to be done, so we'd like to see 
these ongoing biomass projects. We'd like to see more biomass projects. We'd like to expand the, the biomass energy campus. Uh, and, and we'd really like to keep those efforts moving forward, both for the sake of forest health and for the sake of our local economy. Um, and, and finally, we, don't, we, haven't, we haven't really uh, pursued any projects uh, with, with vast collaborations, bringing ODFW and the Freshwater Trust and the Oregon Department of Energy and everyone together to the table uh, to, really, to really get some stuff done. But we, we're working on some projects uh, that have the potential to provide huge benefits for fish uh, and, and the rivers and in-stream health and in-stream flows. And by bringing irrigators to the table with other, uh, other advantages to them through these hydro projects and through energy savings, uh, we think that we can really do, do a lot of good things uh, for, for our, our fish and, and river health as well, in addition to just fo focusing on our forest health. Uh, so that's, that's really what what we've got going on the ground uh, and what we'd like to see done and, and the things that, that these guys are doing uh, are really helping us move these projects along and there are, there are some regulatory uh, problems but there are a lot of really good incentives, a lot of really good financing out there uh, and we're, we're moving things right along. So with that I'll, I'll leave it to questions. Does anyone have a question? So hopefully that's generated a lot of uh, uh, thought in your minds. I, that was uh, a fantastic three um, presentations and perspectives of, of which uh, hit the ball out of the park and from my perspective of what I, I was hoping to get out of this. So um, please, um, I have a few questions that I want to ask, but I, you, you dedicated some time uh, to come to this event, and so I want to turn the, this part of the agenda over to you all. Um, and when you stand up, if you, I'm going to call on you. Please just stand up, uh, say your name, ask your question, um, so that so that we can hear and kind of be loud. We don't have a microphone to pass around necessarily. Um, oh, I'm being told that we do have a microphone in the center of the in, in the aisle there. If you can make your way there, um, and I'll ask the panelists as you respond to just be louder, or you can come up here, or but that might be a little um, logistically challenged. So much, so just be loud, just be loud. Who wants to ask the first question? Sure, jump in there. Uh, thank you for being here. I think this is great, so I appreciate it. Um, I've worked in renewable energy for a few years now, and so I've, I've seen how I feel like there's several tracks that need to be developing simultaneously uh, to reach where we want to be. We've got you know, not, not only policy and incentives, not only permitting and siting, education for the consumer, job force development, all those kind of things need to rise together and all be ready at the same time. Otherwise, you've got really good incentives and horrible installations or equipment that doesn't work and yada, yada, yada. Um, how, do we, how does Oregon do that? Who, who can do that? Can Odo tell, talk to Fish and Wildlife and try to get siting easier for a customer? Can, you know, can the governor's office do things? How do, how do we do that all at the same time and, and that big picture view so that they all come together at the same time?
to the best benefit of the communities that are being served by them and to the best use of that resource, the most efficient use of that resource. So that's one way that we can approach that challenge in, in, from sort of a different angle that I think achieves what we're, what we're trying to overall. Uh, the other thing is, is the, the regional engagement that we have. Hopefully we'll give Oregon a, a larger voice in the discussions in the, within the federal system about how we want that energy system to work and what it means for our communities. Um, but I don't think we are under any uh, illusion that it's not going to be a, a, a steep hill to decline, but makes it ride down and better, I suppose. Yeah. 
countries uh, trying to achieve a level of economic um, affluence that we have been blessed with, and issues related to resource scarcity and climate change. And then there's also this tremendous economy, I mean, or opportunity. These really are the sectors that are, are growing at this point. So I don't, I don't think, I don't think it's going to be easy, but I, I think it's here to stay. And related to the incentives and, and subsidies, I just always like to point out that part of what would help this become sustained and not boom and bust is to start forcing the right narrative. We hear all the time that double-digit costs for a gallon of gasoline would tank the U.S. economy. We're already paying them. It's four dollars at the pump. You factor in the subsidies and tax breaks for oil and gas exploration and the use of our military to protect ocean going tankers and overseas oil reserves, and it's into the double digits. And what's happening now, often we're not paying that, we're putting it on her credit card with a, fit, with a $15 trillion national debt. So I think, um, I think we need to really start telling a real story and not just roll it over and accepting it when someone says that these technologies are too expensive. And one of the things that we're looking at um, here in Oregon, um, we've got some folks in the room who are actually helping to work on this, how can we begin to capture, internalize the real costs and the real benefits of some of these um, some of these clean energy, clean economy opportunities. So for instance, talk about keeping more money local, we spend, or Oregon spends about $14 billion on energy each year, and 85% of that money leaves the state. To put that in perspective, that is more than twice what we spend on K-20 education. We would solve our education funding issues if, if we make the shift. So, but I also think, you know, uh, from a boom bust perspective economically, we have some challenges here in Oregon. There is a reason that we're the only state in the union that relies pretty much 100% on income tax and has a kicker. I just leave it with that. There's a reason no one else has copied that. <laughs> I guess I might just sort of chime in on answering the question too. As the owner of the project, I would say, I, in my mind, it's sustainable. And part of the reason is, I think, it goes back to what Matt was saying about incentives. Incentives kind of got us headed in, in a direction. We got people thinking, and we, as a state and as an economy, have started thinking about renewable energy. And so I think they serve a purpose in that way. I, I feel like um, part of making them sustainable is is that now that we, as a, as a Economy are looking in this direction. I think that our innovation is getting better, and our understanding of of, uh, of the systems are getting better. And what I was saying back to what Matt was talking about is, you know, we're starting to look at it as the highest and best use. So, you know, biomass, for example, we really incentivize electricity, and it's really not the best use for biomass in a lot of cases, stand alone, just for electricity. But now that we started looking in that direction, I think a lot of people have started to integrate other um, better uses like thermal into it that help make it more sustainable long term. And so I think the incentives have sort of a purpose in a way and that they've directed us in, in a direction and I think it's on us now to really take the innovation to the next level. And I think innovation is what's gonna what's gonna push it from boom and bust to sustainable smile. And just to tag on to that really quickly, some of the, in the recommendations for the 10-year energy plan that have come forward, getting better incentives for the thermal component is in there. So, um, big opportunity for us, I think. Who smells pizza? <laughs> so first of all, before we do that, um, I do want to take a, a, an opportunity to thank our three panelists for providing an amazing amount of information. So thank you. And, and Jennifer's pointing at something in the back of the room that I'm not interpreting. Yeah. And before we break, before we break, we do, uh, at Sustainable Northwest, we host other events, and sometimes we do these things called supply-demand forums, and mostly that's about wood products. 
But in this case, I see the resource as being information. So if you work at Portland uh, State University at the Institute for Sustainable Solutions, raise your hands, please. Stand up. If you want to talk to them about PSU's programs, there they are. If you work at Sustainable Northwest, raise your hand. There they are. Go talk to them. If you work in Wallowa County, please stand up. Raise your hands. Go see those guys about the innovative stuff happening on the ground. The pizza's over here. Thanks to Hot Lips for donating it. And thanks to all of you for, for joining us tonight. Thanks.